Best Practices Webinar Series, which was brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project funded by the Exascale Computing Project of the U.S. Department of Energy. This is done in collaboration with the Computing Facilities at the Argon, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Mosley Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the hostess for today's webinar. So you want to be agile. Strategies for introducing agility into your scientific software project. And the webinar will be presented by Michael Lehu from Sandia National Laboratories. Mike is a senior scientist at Sandia and the director of the software technologies for the uh, uh, XAScale Computing Project, as well as scientist in residence at St. John's University in Minnesota. Mike's research interests include all aspects of scalable scientific and engineering software for new and emerging parallel computing architectures. He leads several projects in this field, including Trilinos, which is a collection of scalable scientific software components, Mantevo, which is an open source portable mini applications and mini drivers for the co-design of future supercomputers and applications, and the HPCG, which is a benchmark for ranking computer systems. Mike's most recent interests are focused on improving scientific software developer productivity and software sustainability. As Ashley mentioned, all attendees have been muted. We'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc, whose address we have pasted into the chat of WebEx. The webinar, the webinar will have a break so Mike can respond to the questions that come in. Mike? Thank you, Osni. Uh, can you give me presenter? <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Excuse me. All right, very good. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, excuse me, I swallowed wrong. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so first I want to acknowledge uh, my funding sources, uh, Office of Science, uh, Oscar, uh, and the Exascale Computing Project, and then my employer, uh, Sandia National Labs, and for the opportunity to uh, conduct uh, activities like today. Um, I also wanted to alert you to a, a previous webinar I gave back in September of 2017. Not that you need to have seen it or understand uh, the content from that, but just to say that um, this isn't the first conversation I've had in this setting uh, with uh, some of you at least. And if, you, if something's not clear or if you want some more detail on some of the things I'm going to mention, it may be worth going back to that uh, particular webinar. <coughs> excuse me, to uh, get some of those details. So a bit of an outline. Um, first, I, I give a, 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 some talks in this area, and I always try to give my, what my, a characterization of my perspective. I am not an expert, so I'll tell you, you know, my, my perspective on these uh, topics. Uh, then we'll move and uh, discuss um, I, what I think is a char decent characterization of Agile and scientific software. Um, I want to give a brief recap of Kanban checklists and policies because, it, you know, since uh, I spoke about them back in September of 2017, I've only continued to, to grow enamored of them and, and learn and, and try to get more experience and apply them a variety of settings. So I just can't give this talk without at least some <clears throat> mention of those topics. Um, uh, then I'll talk about planning uh, because I think that is an area in scientific software teams where I think there are opportunities um, for improvement um, based on my uh, kind of survey of, of a lot of projects that I've seen and been involved in. And then I want to give you a couple practical techniques that I think could be beneficial to you as a team. Uh, then I want to talk a bit about a strategy for introducing new practices and tools and, and then wrap up with a couple of uh, short topics on personal expectations. And then a, a new topic, to, at least to me, and as far as I know, new in generally, broadly speaking, is the notion of software science. All right, let's get started. <clears throat> so my perspective, um, I, I'm not a, really an expert in agile software uh, methodologies. I, I don't want to pretend to be, um, but I have had a lot of experience writing scientific software and have done so over a long period of time, so I've been able to see uh, the, the, the benefits or negative impacts 
of decisions that we make and practices and things that we do or don't do as we produce scientific software. Um, so I, I look at myself more as, you know, say a psychologist who enables conversation or tries to bring to light uh, things that might work or might be worth focusing on. Also, um, when it comes to tools and processes, I'm more like a carpenter uh, than an expert. You know, I try things out and, and things either work for me or they don't. And I and if something does work, um, I like to share that. I get excited about it and want to share that with you. <clears throat> so that's my perspective and, and, it, and it permeates the entire presentation. Um, so if we're going to give a talk about Agile, I think it's worth talking about um, probably the most famous statement of what Agile is, and that's the Agile Manifesto. And you can go to agilemanifesto.org um, and see this page right here, <clears throat> the set of statements, the, the authors of it. Um, and um, I don't know if you can tell so well, but um, there are four basic pillars, four basic statements, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. And in fact, you know, the changes in font size are actually present on this website um, because they want to emphasize uh, the, the importance of the things on the left versus the things on the right. Not that the things on the right are not valuable, but the things on the left are, are perhaps more valuable. They value them more on the left. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so, um, I, I, and I hope, you know, if you're a scientific software developer, you, you will actually find the left side quite comforting and interesting and, and probably resonating with how you already behave. And, and so a part of my message is that um, as a scientific community and as scientific software developers, I think we're actually doing a lot of the things on the left. Um, we do individuals and interactions. We, we like working software. We want customer collaborations. We want to respond to change. It's a part of our nature. As we do interactions, we go to meetings. Uh, we, we write things, software we want to use. Uh, we want to interact with people. And, and, and you know, the results from one uh, execution of our software may totally change the requirements and, and lead us in a new path because we, because we discovered something new. <clears throat> However, I would argue that, um, at least in my experience, we're, we're so focused on things on the left that we actually have opportunities to improve by, by doing a little bit more of, on things on the right of these four pillars. Um, and, and in fact, I tried to indicate by the size of the font where I think you know, how much we actually emphasize the things on the right. Um, I, I, I think we do, as a, as a whole, you know, do um, use tools and we do documentation. We do, in some instances, follow a plan. I find very few teams, and I think this is not, not a bad thing, that have to worry about contract negotiations, so that's probably okay. Um, but anyway, let me, let me go on a little bit and I'll come back and revisit this just a bit in a bit. <clears throat> Another thing I think that's worth keeping in mind is, is this quote from Fred Brooks, who's, uh, among other things, has written the book, The Mythical Man Month, uh, a well-regarded software engineering expert. Um, he says that a scientist builds in order to learn, an engineer learns in order to build. And so basically, a scientist or a scientist who's doing software is doing barely sufficient building in most instances, because the real objective is the scientific result that they're trying to get to publish a paper, to get insight, um, you know, to prepare for a meeting, those kinds of things. Whereas an engineer, the purpose is to build something. And so they do sufficient learning so that they can exactly. build what they want. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the challenge is, is that if, we're, if we don't put enough effort into the building as a scientist or the learning as an engineer, we get poor results, poor software. All right, so um, I want to argue that Agile and scientific software are a combination worth pursuing. And so I'm going to um, try to bring out some relevant Agile attributes so for scientific software teams. So, so there are a lot of different Agile methodologies. Um, probably the most common are Scrum. I'm guessing most people have heard of that. Kanban, extreme programming, less so, so uh, in recent past, but still around. Um, Scrum is certainly the most popular in industry. Um, I, I think somewhere upwards of 80% of teams um, you know, at, at say that they use Scrum. Um, what are some of the characteristics? 
iteration, incrementation, engaging users, a hierarchical planning approach. Um, and, and this, as I said, is quite consistent with scientific software uh, development. <clears throat> scientific software development attributes are things such as, for example, many of us have advanced degrees, often a PhD in a scientific domain. Um, we are spending, as, as a rule, um, a lot of our time engaging in the community. Uh, getting a PhD is not the end of your research career, it's actually the beginning of your research career, and, and you spend a significant amount of time uh, keeping that degree fresh, keeping your stature in the community fresh. Uh, and we honestly have typically little time for cultivating advanced software practices if we're also serious about being an expert in the field, in our domain. And so we have this persistent choice that we have to make, better practices or newer results sooner. We need both to compete well, um, but it's a persistent choice that we're regularly making um, as we conduct our work. <clears throat> as our software becomes more interdeveloped, though, we have to have better practices because we tend, as we've seen, at least in my area, um, teams are getting larger, uh, multiple teams are grouping together and coordinating with each other. And, and so these practices and how we conduct our work has an impact not only locally on our team, but other teams as well. Uh, another aspect of scientific software is that um, we tend to have specialized expertise. And a lot of agile methodologies, if there's a task on the list that needs to get done, um, there's usually more than one person who can take that task on. Uh, whereas in the scientific team, there's often just one person who really has the skills to, to pull in a task. And that's just one example of how, if we're going to take agile approaches and adapt them and adopt them on our scientific teams, we need to be cognizant of how our teams might be uh, distinctive from, a, say, a typical team that might be using uh, agile methods and, and the literature that's been built up over time. All right, so that's a little bit of a characterization, I would say, of, of Agile and scientific software. And I want to go back to the manifesto anti-themes, <clears throat> the things that were on the right. And, and so, so I want to talk just, just a little bit about uh, stories for new processes and tools. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on processes and tools. In my experience, um, our community has really picked up on, on emerging platforms such as GitHub and GitLab. And because the tools that they provide are relatively easy to use and there's a lot of good documentation, I, I have seen teams rapidly adopt uh, these platforms and the tools that go with them. And that's for, to great benefit for our scientific software team. So in a certain way, I think we're doing quite well there. Um, I have also, in my experience, seen really good documentation coming out of our community. I, I find regularly projects use Read the Docs as a, a platform for documentation development. Uh, Doxygen is embedded documentation for uh, functions and methods, um, argument lists and things like that, and, and then regular publications. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about lightweight design documentation because I think it's an opportunity that uh, for some teams uh, that they may not have considered. And I want to give an example of how I think that could be uh, in, enhanced a bit without a lot of work and provide a lot of value. I'm not going to talk about contract negotiations. I think many of us, uh, re re uh, we write funding proposals, uh, but we don't really negotiate contracts, uh, say, as, as what would commonly be done in industry. Um, so I'm not going to touch on that. Um, I do want to talk about following a plan. Um, in a recent survey I did of, of a set of software teams, um, this is one area where I think there's opportunity for improvement. Um, I, I saw in the survey that was conducted that of quite a few teams, the most detailed description of the requirements of their product are in the funded proposal. And so um, to me, that says there's an opportunity to create further um, elaboration of a plan. What are the requirements? You know, how might you design this thing? And, and so a lot of teams, if, if the survey results are, are accurate, are going straight from a funder proposal statement to writing and designing and working out the requirements in the software base. And to me, that says we have an opportunity for improvement. <clears throat> All right, so I just want to give a brief update. Maybe I'll pause, uh, Ashley. Are there any 
uh, questions have come up or Rosny? Yes, there is one question, Mike. Is there one tool for Agile sure. or, uh, or do I need more than one? Ah, good question. Um, yeah, there are, there are lots of tools for Agile um, and, and most people would want to use more than one. Um, I, I think one of the more one of the common tool sets that's around are the Atlassian tools. So in, with the Atlassian tools, um, you get things like uh, Confluence, which is a, a very nice uh, uh, online collaborative uh, wiki development tool for for creating, storing, and managing content. Lots of different kinds of content. Um, for example, in the Exascale Computing Project. Um, at San Diego National Laboratories, um, we, we commonly use Confluence and with, with great positive uh, influ impact from that use. Um, another Atlassian tool is called JIRA, uh, which is an issue management uh, software product that integrates nicely with Confluence. Um, it is also, I think, overall a very nice tool. Uh, although I think people who are um, use other issue tracking tools, find that JIRA can be a bit complicated to use. Uh, and so it's maybe not the first tool that you might use. Um, uh, at Latin also uh, just recently purchased Trello, uh, not, you know, not too long ago at least. Um, and, and they also provide a, another set of tools. I think most teams that use that Latin product definitely use Confluence and JIRA. And those two tools provide a lot of the infrastructure that you would need to take on agile development pro uh, practices, including being able to do Scrum and being able to do Kanban as two agile workflows. Um, and another tool set that is much um, you know, easier for a lot of teams to use is uh, our, our GitHub and GitLab. And both of them also offer similar kinds of wiki or you know, documentation type, type capabilities and also issue tracking and including um, lighter weight um, project boards that would allow you to do Scrum or Kanban. So those are two, prob uh, three really uh, common platforms that a person could get started with if they wanted to do Agile. Okay, should I continue on? Yes, please, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I, I just briefly want to mention checklists and policies just because I did speak about them back in September of 2017. But I, I continue to find them of such large value. And, and the, the two common checklists I use are, are a new team member checklist and a departing member checklist. Um, it, because we, I, I work with students a fair bit and I'm getting new students in on a regular basis. And I have a master checklist that I use with them to make sure that they ramp up and they can see exactly what they need to do. And we can together see the progress that they're making on that. Also students leave, and so I have a departing checklist for them. Um, and then in, a, in the middle of that is the, is the set of policies. And policies I find are, are useful in a variety of ways. One is it helps build a team understanding of what is expected in terms of behavior um, and what, and what you know, best practices are expected. And so um, all of these are really important elements, I think, in, in any software team. And so I wanted to, re, uh, you know, to mention those again. Um, I've also, since that talk, done a very lightweight uh, resource um, that you'll see at the bottom of this 18 tools uh, repository that lay out some of the, the basics of what I find useful. Again, it's you know, low bar startup. And uh, there are some you know, candidate checklists that you could you know, use as a starting point or at least get the sense of what I'm trying to say. And so I wanted to mention that, that the, these approaches continue to have value to me. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to mention the iterative work systems from an, an Kanban. Um, and Kanban. And since September 2017, I have seen a lot of teams that have used Scrum with great success. And, and in fact, it's actually quite inspiring to see their effective use of Scrum. Um, primarily, though, in industry, um, as part of the Exascale Computing Project, I have the uh, great privilege of meeting with industry partners on our industry council. And so I've been able to meet a lot of software team leads and, and, and their stories of how effective Scrum are, is for them are really inspiring. Um, I've also seen at some of the labs 
that with teams that who, whose team members are primarily there you know, on an everyday basis, kind of nine to five, Monday through Friday, you know, methodical and, and pretty steady life, that uh, Scrum can really be effective for them. Um, and, you know, Scrum is quite structured. Um, I think most teams would practice what's called Scrum but, meaning they do most of what Scrum uh, dictates, but they may slack off or omit you know, some aspect of the Scrum uh, life cycle, work cycle. Um, um, the, the key things are regular sprints and reviews, retrospectives to try to understand what went well, what didn't, uh, the use of stories as a way of defining requirements, uh, use of a backlog of set of stories. And there are very specific roles for the product owner, the scrum master, and, and more. There's, and so it's quite elaborate and, and it's probably not in my, at least in my experience, the thing that um, most people would want to pick up the very first approach they would use. Um, Kanban is, I think at least, a little bit easier to take on. Um, and the fundamental principle is the limiting the number of in-progress tasks. You're trying to optimize flexibility versus swap overhead. So by focusing on, you know, at most a few things that you're gonna do, you, you allow yourself to retain that, um, you know, that focus on a handful of things. And, and, and just, you know, why wouldn't Scrum be so great and why would Kanban be better? And I try to give in the right there some list, right? That you know, Scrum is meant for a methodical development. It, it, it can support discovery-based uh, work, but it's hard, it, it's harder. Um, and so I have found in my experience, at least initially, that teams can benefit from doing Kanban in a way that uh, is harder with Scrum. Uh, here's just a basic Kanban board. Again, I'm not going to go into detail because I have spoken about this in the past. But you know, if you had a, a set of columns, a backlog, which is any task that you think you might want to do, the ready column is any task that uh, would be ready to be worked on because you, you know what you need to do. It's well scoped. Um, and then the in-progress column is the things that you're working on right now, and then the done is what you completed already. And you can add other columns. I often have an in-review column for things that I think are done, but I want to give to somebody else to take a look at. And then having a blocked column is nice for things that you were perhaps working on, but you can't work on now because you're relying on some other input or decision before you can pick it up again. Again, so Kanban is, I think, very nice. Um, so what I like about Kanban and why I, I, I try to advocate for it in this particular situation, if you're just getting started with Agile methodologies, is you can apply Kanban today to any existing project partially. You can, and you, all you have to do is really to start collecting and organizing the tasks, the things that you want to do into the columns I just showed. Uh, you can use GitHub projects as a way of creating those columns and managing your GitHub issues. You can use JIRA. It has a has an automatic generation of a Kanban board uh, you, for JIRA issues. Um, and GitLab has similar kind of capabilities that all support this column layout of work tasks. And, and even without managing your work, even without you know, saying, I'm, I'm gonna limit the number of things I have in progress at once, just having the dashboard alone itself has tremendous value. It gives you a view of everything that you want to do and have done and, and the things that you're working on. And so um, I, I use Kanban boards for a lot of different things. And, and I find them very useful. You know, the, probably the biggest challenge I have is the number of Kanban boards I have to manage. But, you know, it, it's okay. Each one of them is directly linked by a URL. And, and so I can go to it. I can have my boards up, you know, all of them at once if I want to look at more than one of them. Uh, the hardest thing about, I think, Kanban, Kanban boards and for me when I have multiple is just knowing, having a sense of how many things are in progress and how, you know, when should I start limiting? Because I have, I don't have all of my uh, uh, in progress tasks on one list. But, you know, it, 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 that, that is an issue, but I still think there's tremendous value. Um, the other thing I find is running meetings using a shared dashboard is uh, really nice. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is when you fall out of the habit of using your board. So um, I use boards and, and every once in a while we can get like crazy or chaotic or maybe I don't meet with a group for a while and, it, and I fall out of the habit of using it. 
don't give up. That's not a chance, a reason to give up. It's just, just start up again. And, and I think that's a good attitude to take. All right, I'll pause here for, are there any questions? No, Mike, you can continue. Very good, excellent. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I wanna talk about planning because as I mentioned, uh, I think this is an area where as a community, scientific software developers could, could do a bit more in terms of formal planning, objectively planning uh, what we're doing. Um, and I just bring up this quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Many people say this, I think, but it's attributed to him that, you know, it's the planning process that is, that's most important, that you tried out in your head a variety of approaches to solving the problem. Um, you, you write down a plan, you start executing it, and, you know, shortly after you start executing it, it's no longer exactly relevant. But because you've explored other options, you have a mental model for adapting your activities to still benefit from the planning act activities you did. Okay, I wanna show no two notional charts um, because I've seen this and this takes years usually to play out. Um, what I wanna do is first talk about the, you know, the code and fix development approach um, because I think it's pretty common. Uh, so what do we do in this? Well, um, so we start at the beginning of the project on the left, and, and the, 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 the vertical axis is percent of effort that goes into the three types of activities. Well, you know, so if we start off with an, an undisciplined project, we might do a little planning of what we want to do, but we really first start also writing code. We start, you know, getting things going and, and computing results. And we didn't spend a lot of time trying to figure out, well, what are the exact requirements we need from our code, you know, now and in, in the longer term. We didn't really think a lot about the design of the software. We just had this notion of what it should do. And so we started working on it. Um, now, as time proceeds, um, you didn't spend a lot of time in planning, um, which is okay. That means you get a lot of code out. Um, you don't have to do a lot of recoding because it's a new effort and porting to new platforms, you're working on it. So it's, you're porting it to the platforms as you're writing the code. And so you don't really realize, you know, any of the potential long-term challenges early on in the project. Um, but as time goes on, you find that, that you have to spend more time planning because you didn't really architect the software because the new requirements emerge that you didn't anticipate. You're spending more time in planning um, just to simply change the code without totally disrupting what is done in the past. Um, and then you also have to do recoding because you realize that some of your requirements force you to recode it in order to get those new features in. And then as you port it to new platforms, um, it takes a lot of effort because again, you didn't, for example, isolate uh, the portions of the code that are in, impacted by architecture uh, as an example. And then over time, and I've seen this happen, um, what happens is you spend so much time in planning, so much effort in recoding and porting to new platforms that eventually you realize, I, I can't use this code anymore, and you have to give it up. And that this, this kind of dynamic is not uncommon for undisciplined or unplanned projects. What I want to propose instead is that early on in the project, spend a chunk, a thin slice of time doing planning. And I'll show you two basic ways that you can get going on planning um, so that you can figure out, well, what are the requirements that I need from this product? Um, and what is an architecture that will allow me to say, do at least, you know, some number of iterations as we go to new platforms and to support recoding of small portions, isolated portions of the software uh, without having to re-implement or, or a touch you know, lots of lines of code as we go forward. And so with this approach by doing some planning, yes, you have invested a fair bit of time up front in planning um, and doing design. And that's why it's such a big portion of that early phase is in the planning activity. And, and you're not getting that early visible progress in writing code, but in the long run, it will produce something that you can sustain much more easily and, in the, and integrated over a sufficient span of time will provide a lot more value than if you simply go right to coding with less, uh, fewer design and, and, and planning activities, requirements and design. Okay, 
So I want to talk now about two techniques uh, for, that, that I think could be valuable to you if you're just getting started with Agile approaches. So, so just to make a distinction, Agile is, is both a methodology, you know, something like uh, Kanban or, or Scrum, but you also have to, you know, so, so they both say require that you collect requirements and you analyze requirements, but then the how of that is it is a set of practices and so i'm going to give you just a couple practices that i have found value have seen a value in our community and one of them is stories <clears throat> and so if you haven't used stories before there they follow a pattern they're, i'm going to talk about two kinds of story user stories and and a newer technique with what's called a job story which i really like and i think may be appropriate for uh our teams uh it might it's a little maybe a little bit more na natural to us. And, and basically the pattern of a user story is you say, as a, I want, so that. So, you know, as a particular kind of user, I want to, uh, you know, do a certain activity so that I can accomplish a certain objective or goal. And so um, it provides a nice pattern for you as, a, as a developers or your users even to, to, to describe what they want a product to do. Um, and so it's a very lightweight method for defining, refining, and prioritizing tasks. And so it allows you to quickly and inexpensively describe what the product should do. And, and as I said, um, and, oh, I, actually, let me highlight. So, so you know, these, this is not um, something you put your blinders on and just do, right? Uh, these are techniques that work for some situations, may not work, may need some skill, and may need some adaptation in order for you to realize the values. Uh, so th this is not a prescriptive technique. There's, this is not um, something that has say proven um, value in every single instance, but I think these are techniques that can pre provide value to teams and that's why I wanna mention them. Um, and then as I mentioned, the job story is when, and so an instance, what, what kind of situation I want to do something so that I can accomplish something. And so rather than being role-based, it is activity-based. And I think in some of our scientific software efforts, we don't have so many roles that in, in terms of how the software is, is used. It's not a complicated architecture from the term in point of uh, view of having lots of different actors or, or you know, users in, in, uh, that are at accessing the product. But we often want to accomplish, you know, a fairly sophisticated list of activities. And so that's why the job story can be particularly useful. Um, so what are the phases of this in my experience? Um, the first phase is just to generate stories and, and to brainstorm. Don't worry about the phrasing. Don't worry about the size or the details. Um, I find that using a table like the one I just show, show on the screen here is a really good way to get people to put content in. And so I, again, so in my, in my situation, you use that multiple people who are trying to contribute to uh, the stories, writing them. And so if you have a shared document, you know, for example, a Confluence document, you know, Google Doc can work if you want to use that or, or, or you know, even, even on uh, you know, uh, GitHub uh, with uh, Markdown, you can do these kinds of activities. And so there are lots of ways to provide a shared document where people can collaboratively enter this content. <clears throat> Once you've collected a set of stories, whether they're user stories or job stories, um, you can begin the discussion. First of all, just decide, are any of them out of scope? You know, someone, it was an okay idea or maybe it just, you know, didn't really fit. Uh, and then you can then further go and try to clarify the stories, maybe make sure that everyone understands what the phrases mean, and then try to right-size them. And by right-sizing uh, them, you want to put them in, a, in a, a scope of effort that can be accomplished over, say, a few weeks to a few months of time, at, at, le at least when you're getting started. You don't, um, there, there, are, there are hierarchical planning techniques called epic story task, where you can get more involved in you know, longer time, short, and, and you know, very short times. Uh, but just to get started, you know, scoping things like this is useful. And then prioritize and choose. And again, you don't need to order all the stories but you just need to order the top uh, set that you're gonna work on. And then you can set the others aside and come back to them at a later time if um, you, after you finished uh, the, the set that you selected. Um, 
I have found stories not only to be useful in, in software development, but also in tool selection. Um, for example, if you want to go out, I, I worked with a set of student teams recently, and I had them use stories to identify the features they needed from tools. And in particular, they needed to pick an IDE, an integrated development environment. Um, they hadn't used one uh, for C++ yet. They had been doing Java development until then. Um, and and what, one of the cool things that came out of this is one team stumbled upon, upon a, a platform called Cloud9 from AWS. AWS and it's really cool. It, it's the, essentially the Google Docs of IDEs. Um, and so that was a, a really nice benefit that came out of that exploration phase by using stories. Um, you can also use stories to define what you want in a team policy. What, what as a you know, role on the team, what do you want? What do you expect? And so it helps to elicit the behaviors and practices that a team uh, should, could, should sign up for. And then also for a group reorg, we recently re reorganized uh, the software technology uh, focus area of the Exascale Computing Project, and we gave team members an opportunity to put in their stories to make sure that as we did the reorg, that we were addressing their concerns and their needs, uh, what they needed from ECP uh, software technology. So, so these stories have a, a wide usage uh, as a way of gathering and, and organizing requirements. Um, then the second uh, planning activity I want to uh, just mention a bit is, is, is documenting design. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's because if you make a mistake in a design document and somebody finds it, it's really as simple as just changing the document. If you make a design mistake and you write the software, you won't find out for months, maybe years. And then you, it's really difficult at that point. You have to either totally rework it or, or live with the flaw. Uh, and, and, and neither situation is attractive, and I've experienced both. So I just, again, I, the point here is not to get into fancy design tools. You can get, there are all sorts of fancy ways to do design. And, and I'm, I'm not saying they're bad, but I'm saying that if you haven't done design in an ex, as an explicit step in the past, you don't have to go immediately and start learning uh, unified modeling language and doing class diagrams and interaction diagrams. Um, it, all of that is good, but a small step that can help you is to simply write up what you are going to produce as a piece of software. And I use as an example, uh, the Cocos kernels, they wanted to write a set of micro and batched blobs, basic linear algebra subprograms. Um, and, and they wanted to do that so it could be adaptable to a variety of computing architectures. It had to be high performance. And so rather than go off right away and start writing code, um, they took some time, six weeks, and they wrote a LaTeX design document with a few diagrams. And then they passed that document around to, to experts in architecture, experts in programming environments, uh, users who needed to be able to use the product when it was done, and the, the rest of the development team that was working on it. And they made very significant design changes in that document. Um, which if they hadn't done in the document, they would have written the code, they would have started, to, and it would have worked on the target, the first target platform, but they would have discovered once they moved from um, multi-core CPUs to the GPUs that the design was not optimal. And so by putting this document out and getting it in, in front of people who uh, had uh, programming models and architecture expertise, they were able to detect flaws in the design that allowed them to re redo the document, the, in the design in the document, and then in a few weeks write that code. And that code is working really well now on these target set of architectures in a way that would not have been possible if they hadn't done this uh, bit of documentation work. All right. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I've, I've talked about um, agile uh, principles, the four pillars, I talked about how we do a pretty good job in, in most of the ones that we care about, how planning um, is something that I think as an opportunity we have as a scientific software community for improving our, the quality of our work. And, and now I wanna talk a little bit about how you might introduce changes into your existing practices and processes and tools. 
Um, and and as this is just an adaptation of a Martin Fowler, Fowler quote. Um, uh, so, uh, unlike industry, at least some industries I know, we do not tend to send our scientific software developers off for extensive training periods. Um, I have a daughter who works in the uh, software industry. She spent the first six months of her uh, job going off to the company's software uh, engineering training where they gave her all of the background. Now, she didn't need to learn the domain. She didn't have a PhD that she had to maintain. Uh, she didn't have the conferences that she had to go to, to and, and papers to publish to keep make sure that she was competing well in her field. She just got to learn about how to do software. Now, we don't have that luxury for the most part on our scientific teams. Instead, what we have to do is we have to do improvements on our way to getting our work done. So we need to improve how we do our work on the way to getting it done. And so this kind of incremental introduction of improvements is, in my experience, the way that we can see value and still not have it cost too much as we produce scientific results. And so we have created uh, within the Ideas Project what we call a PSIP process, Plant Productivity and Sustainability Improvement Planning. Um, and this URL down at the bottom, the PSIPs tools uh, URL gives this overview of how, again, it's, it's nothing fancy, but it gives you some sense of what we're trying to do by, by uh, first of all, snapshot, get an, 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 a brief documentation of the current practices um, in that description of, and of practices, you can usually find a few things that um, could benefit from you know, either a better process, use of a better tool, better methodology, and then, I, and then make a short list of those things, and then create what we call a progress tracking card that lays out steps to improving. First of all, baselines your current practice, and then gives you points for uh, improvements as you make them. Um, and then you execute the plan to improve the practice or the process or the tool that you're using, assessing progress as you do it. And then once that's done, you repeat. And so this incremental approach we have found to be an attractive way of trying to get changes in our uh, software teams done without disrupting too much our ability to still make uh, progress in our scientific results. Uh, this is just an example of a progress tracking card where the scores go from zero to five. And so if a team that hasn't done test coverage may have little or no independent testing. They may do some functional testing, uh, but you know, the users actually do it for them. Um, and they, what they like to do is move in a steady way towards better and better uh, both functional and unit testing uh, and, and it, see the value and the improvement as they go along. And that's the role of the progress tracking card. Um, so we, we've done this with a few teams, uh, MPICH team, they're the, they're the makers of one of the two main uh, MPI implementations. Um, and they realized they needed a, a formal, you know, lightweight way of onboarding new team members. And so they created this progress tracking card for onboarding and were able to uh, successfully implement that up to the, th the third step um, already. And then fourth one is, is work being done this year. Exalt is, a, is a, a, an, a, an effort, an application effort um, within uh, the Exascale Computing Project. And they also uh, introduced continuous integration and, and testing improvements um, to their uh, product development. And again, using these progress tracking cards. And so this has been a reasonable approach, again, fairly lightweight, fairly informal but a way to get changes into your product. I think if you um, try to do too much at once, it really does um, put at risk your ability to get science done. And that's what we get paid to do. And so you, I think this notion of doing incremental and iterative improvement is, and taking on just the right size amount of improvement that still allows us to get our work done is, is a tunable way for us to succeed in getting better practices, processes, and tools into our software uh, development efforts. I have two more topics I want to mention. Um, <clears throat> one is personal expectations. Uh, so I found that I, I, I can lay out all of these you know, big picture things and objectives to, to the software teams I work with, but I also felt like I needed to, to 
appeal to each person on the team um, so that they felt a sense of ownership and a, and a kind of call to being a better version of, them, of themselves. Uh, and, and so I think this is something else that is worth um, uh, instilling into the teams that you have on your software or the members of your team, uh, your software team. And, and so uh, just as an example, uh, you know, there, I, I stumbled upon this Canadian engineer's oath and, and this quote from uh, the writer uh, Rudyard Kipling. Um, you know, each engineer, each Canadian engineer gets the iron ring that you see on the pinky finger of the right hand. You know, there are, there are legends of where it came from a failed bridge. I don't think it's true, but it's still kind of fun to say. Um, and, and so it's a general commitment on the part of each person who's an engineer that they will live up to a standard. Um, and, and I'd like to suggest the same thing for our team members. Uh, and I want to do two concrete ways. Um, one is, uh, I, I think it's often the case, you, you look at GitHub projects and GitHub stats in particular, you know, there's this heat map of how many commits you know, a person has made if you look on their profile page. And, and I think that's actually the wrong metric in a lot of instances, especially for an undisciplined software team, because if someone, if the team is not disciplined, in other words, they're putting code into their code base and it's not well tested, it's not well documented, it's not well architected, then, then there's a problem. Right, because every line of code that gets injected into that code base just means there's more technical debt, meaning that somewhere in the future, because the job wasn't done right to begin with, uh, somebody has to either do the job over or, in, or enhance it or fill in the gaps or you abandon the work altogether. Um, so I would instead, and you can do this, right? The, our tools allow us at least somewhat, and, and maybe some of it has to be done more manually or informally, but, but rank people or, or give people recognition for the people who write up requirements, who do analysis and design, even if it's simple. Uh, someone who writes good GitHub issues, right, and tracks progress to completion, someone who comments on or tests or accepts pull requests or provides good content in response to user issues. To me, these are better metrics and these uh, it provide incentive to team members uh, to do a more holistic good job than just making commits to the repository. Um, the other thing that I've done and created uh, for my teams is I cr created a, a set of shelf magnets um, that <clears throat> I call you know productivity plus plus. But basically, the notion is is that I, I ask my team members, um, if, you know, go get your cup of coffee, chat with somebody in the hallway, but when you sit down to do your work, after you've gone through the urgent emails, look at this card and ask yourself, is the work I'm gonna do traceable? Meaning I can point back to an origin that this is something really important. Is it in progress? In, in other words, if I'm using Kanban, is this something I'm intentionally working on? Or did I, am I doing it just because someone uh, prodded me by the phone call to, to up, you know, up the priority of something that's not so important? And then is it sustainable? Is it something that um, you know, I'm proud of the work and that I think it will live as long as it should live? And then the fourth one is improved. Am I doing something on a regular basis to improve my skills? And, and so I hand these uh, shelf magnets out and I, I, I see them on the shelves of my work colleagues. So I, I, I hope that they're of, of some value. All right, I have one last thing, topic I wanna mention, and then we can move to questions. And, I, I want to mention because we, I think people on this on this webinar are scientists primarily. I want to mention a concept that I think is new, um, and this is the notion of of what I would call software science, the science of software, not the engineering of software, but the actual science of software. And I want to talk about uh, a new department at Sandia that we're starting up, who has that has a workflow associated with it. So this is a new software engineering and research department at Sandia and my, in the Center for Computing Research at Sandia. And I'm not trying to you know, make a big deal about it, but I'm trying to convey that this is a concrete um, you know, it working model we're trying to develop uh, you know, in an organiz organizational setting. There are three primary workflows in this department. There's a deployment where you can think of as an IT type person, um, there is a, what, what is emerging as what's sometimes called a research software and engineering 
of, of job class and that's in the development phase. And then the third is this research phase, uh, which, which we think is a, a new workflow. We're unaware of, of where you know, applying science to software as a discipline is widely used. And this is kind of a pictorial version of that. So any individual on this team, you know, is not slotted just as research or just as develop or just as deploy, but they, they work across the areas. And so it's a vertically integrated department that has uh, deployment activities, software development activities, and research activities, which we're trying to grow. And it's, it's, it's this research software scientist that is really a new job type. Um, and, and I just bring up a, a scenario that, that tries to evoke why we, why we want to do this. And so, uh, you know, some years ago, computer scientists were not a common part of scientific software teams. Now, in my experience, they're, they're widely available. Um, and, and so before we brought computer scientists into our discipline, we had non-experts doing CSE work. And so they were less available in their own domain. Uh, the CS work took a long time compared to other work because they weren't experts. And we end up with suboptimal results and we pay on high ongoing maintenance costs. I would argue that uh, we are in a similar situation right now. A lot of us don't have software experts on our team. And, and so we, we do the work, but it's not, it, t it takes us away from what we really want to do, our domain. Um, it takes a long time to get it done and we often get suboptimal results. And so what we're trying to do with the software science capability in, and bringing software experts into our scientific software team is to rectify that, that kind of situation. An example of applying science to software teams um, is a, a recent paper done by a postdoc of, of mine, Reed Milovitz, and Elaine Rayburn, a colleague, a social scientist. And, and they're using essential, essentially social science um, techniques, data gathering, analysis, and, and uh, to, to create correlation between things like happiness and connectedness. That's one of the outcomes from this paper. Um, and then as a science, then once you see correlation, that's not cause and effect, but you would design experiments to try to detect cause and effect. And so what I'm trying to argue here is that um, we can apply scientific techniques to better understand how we do research software, how we do scientific software. And I would like to propose that as a community, as scientists, we start using science to better understand how we do software. All right, let me wrap up and then we can go to questions. So I think Agile for scientific software makes sense. If you look at the four pillars of the, of the Agile manifesto, gosh, they just resonate well with me and I think they do with others as well. In fact, we, we're strong on that left side of the, of the four techniques. Um, and we can introduce formality in, a, in an incremental way, right? And so, and we can use lightweight structured planning, Kanban, user job stories, basic design documents as a way to balance out a little bit on the right, some of the things where we may have deficiencies. Um, and then I argue that iteration and implementation are, are the way for us to do it because we can't go and take a six months or a year and become experts in software engineering or software development because we need to keep going in our research efforts. We need to continue to publish and go to meetings and conferences and, and participate uh, in the research community. And then the, finally, the last two things, uh, you know, calling out the best in our teams, you know, articulate the mission of your software team. It may sound hokey, but I, I don't know. I think if you do it right, it can inspire people. And then I really like this notion and I myself personally will continue to start looking at how can we apply scientific methods, the scientific method to software to get a deeper understanding of how we can improve the quality of our scientific software? And I'll stop and thank you uh, for your time and take questions. Hi, Mike. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. First of one, uh, the first one, would you consider Kanban a subset of Agile or simply a stepping stone? <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, I, so I, I think in our community, because we have so many other demands on our time, um, and a lot of our work is interrupt driven, you know, our software work is interrupt driven, that it, it's very difficult for us to, you know, to do, say, a, you know, a, a, a really formal sprint. 
Um, we also tend to have smaller teams where it's not clear that you, you really need a product owner or a scrum master. Um, and, and the teams who, that I've seen who have successfully applied scrum, often they'll start with, with a coach, someone who comes in and, and coaches the team on how to, to play their roles and learn the you know, scrum uh, workflows and methodologies. And so I, I don't know that Kanban is necessarily a, you know, a step on the way to scrum. Um, it could be, and I think perhaps for some teams it is. I, I tell you some days, I wish we could do Scrum because I, I see that, you know, the, the tremendous value that it provides in terms of bringing a team together and getting them to focus and pull all in the same direction at the same time. There's so many positives associated with it. But when I look at all of the other responsibilities that we have as scientists and the interrupt driven aspect of it and the Eureka aspect of it, you know, discovering something, you know, and how do you put that in a, you know, in a sprint? I don't know. I, I guess I don't, See, I don't know. The answer is I don't know, um, but I'd be interested to see how things evolve. We have more questions coming in, Mike. Uh, can, you briefly, sure. can you briefly explain the new software scientist role again? Yeah, sure. Sorry if I didn't do that uh, more fully. So, so the notion here is um, we want to understand how to do a better job of scientific software. How do you make, how do you make developers more, more productive? How do you make the software more sustainable and impactful? Um, and, and so my argument is, well, that's, that's a, that can be turned into a science problem. And how can you turn it into a science problem? Well, it's, it's about a human system and the technology that the human system produces. We know how to study human systems using the tools of social science. We know how to do interviews. We know how to do gate, data gathering. We know how to do information coding. And we can start to see correlations between, as I said, um, connectedness and happiness. The one, the one outcome from the, the paper I showed you was there, there was a connection between people who felt connected to their team members and, and the happiness level that they had in doing their work. Um, and now that's just correlation. So you want to turn that around and make it into a science question. Does connectedness lead to happiness. And so you would design an experiment to try to enhance connectedness on the team and see if that correlated to increased happiness. And, and so what we're doing is we're trying to take the tools of social science and turn them on and you apply them to scientific software. That's that in a nutshell is what we're after. Another one here, Mike, how big a team needs to be before all these extra efforts become <laughs> worthwhile? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, great question. Um, well, I, I think Kanban, you know, a Kanban board is useful for a team of one. Um, you know, I, I use it regularly for managing my own personal uh, tasks. And so at that level, low level, I think it's useful for a team of one. Uh, and I think Kanban can be, it, it grows in value uh, as you have more team members, it also grows in value, at least with, you know, distributed tools for teams that are distributed or aren't necessarily on the same uh, uh, time schedule. You know, I work a lot with students, but I also travel a fair bit. And so I, I use distributed tools to keep on top of the activities. And I use the Kanban board that I manage with my, my students' activities with as a way of having a dashboard on what they're doing. And they can communicate with me, I can communicate with them through the issues and through the board. Uh, and so that again can be done on teams that are, that are small. I think in the literature, or at least the literature I've read, um, you know, Scrum is useful for teams that are say size five to nine dedicated team members. I think that's kind of the optimal size, much less than that. You don't have enough people to see the value from it much more than that. You need to go to what is sometimes called the Scrum of Scrums. And it's a hierarchical Scrum structure uh, you know, certainly beyond what I know well and, and beyond the scope of this conversation. But I, I think, you know, it, even one person uh, can benefit at least from some of the techniques that I described here. So, Mike, one participant is asking for the archive citation. But you oh, yeah, have, yeah. So, so the, I think you have the slides, right, Osmo? Well, I have the slides and then I, yeah. I'm going to paste yeah. the, uh, into this. The, the, okay, great. The, great. Yes. And another question. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, uh, yes, I'll paste the address of this citation to this question and answers. Another question, Mike. 
with the advent of using your concept of a computer scientist role in project, yeah. would, would the CS portion be more scrum based and the science end be Kanban based? That's a great question. Actually, I haven't thought about that. Um, that's actually a cool thought. I hadn't thought. Um, I don't know, but it's worth thinking about. I don't know. I, uh, that's very attractive, actually. Thank well, you for the new idea, whoever yeah, said that. Yeah, so then uh, I, I think you'll have the opportunity to go through the questions uh, again, yeah. and perhaps you can add something there. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think with that, uh, I'd like to thank you, Mike. And, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for all for joining us. And I'd like to take the opportunity to announce the next webinar in this series. Ashley, please. And what I'm going to do here is to share my screen. And uh, so again, so you can give us feedback. Please do so by using that link, Ideas Agile Survey. The slides and recording will be available next week. And uh, uh, we'll send the links to everybody who registered. And the next webinar in this series is going to be in about a month, on June the 12th. And it will be on modern C++ for high-performance computing. And Andrew Lumsden from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory and also the University of Washington will be the presenter. And the site is already open for, you, for interested people to, um, to register. Thank you all. Ashley, do you have any other final remarks? Thank you all for participating. Another good webinar, and we'll hopefully see you next month. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye.